Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 181 for Monday, September 10th, 2018. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Cab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How you doing today, Mr. Kent? Pretty good, Mr. Hamilton. How's life? Life is good. I was, um, I was at a wedding this weekend, uh, not playing. I was attending. I was a guest. Uh, it was my brother-in-law's wedding. Very nice ceremony out in the... Uh, at I guess past the Hamptons, technically on Long Island at the end called, uh, which is a town called Montauk. And, uh, and it That's was a famous town. It That's is the Jaws town. It is the Jaws town. Yeah. It's, um, it's, I'd never been out there before, even though I grew up relatively close to there. I guess you grew up relatively close to there too, but, um, all in the grand scheme of things. In the grand scheme of things. Yeah. But I'd never been out there before. It's a, it's an interesting town. It's, you know, it's a beach town. Uh, simultaneously areas with like, you know, lots of money and areas that are just sort of like rundown beach shacks and, you know, everybody just sort of enjoys each other's company and all that good stuff. So it's actually it's a, way out there, right? It's like two and a half, three hours from Manhattan. If you're lucky. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's like the end of Long Island. It is the end. Yes. Did In you fact, drive or did you take a ferry across? Yes, we did. We did both. Um, <laughs> we, we took the ferry down to New London, Connecticut. And then uh, you actually take the ferry across to Orient Point, Long Island, which is sort of the end of the t of the top edge of Long Island. Yeah. And then Montauk goes is further out on the bottom edge. So you either have to drive around again or you get to take two more ferries. So we did six ferry rides this weekend uh, to get mm -hmm. there, which is fun. You know, it's fine. Whatever. Uh, travel is travel is what it is. Um, and the ferry breaks it up a little bit, which is fine. But um, yeah, Montauk's. All the way at the end, uh, we went to the Montauk Lighthouse and that was it. It's like, OK, well, you know, over there is, uh, you know, m England and maybe the Azores in between if you're looking the right direction. So, <laughs> <laughs> But um, it was it was really interesting, right, because I I've played enough weddings, especially this year that I'm very used to the flow of things. You know, you, you, there's the ceremony and, and whatever, then you get to the reception and while the, 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 what the guests get to the reception while the, um, the wedding party is off doing their pictures and all sorts of things. The guests are treated usually to, you know, some level of what's called cocktail music while there's a cocktail hour and they get everybody, you know, lubed up, uh, in terms of, uh, alcoholics, not, they didn't lube anybody else up in any other ways, uh, that I know of, but, uh, and, and there's some snacks or whatever, you know, going on during cocktail hour. And then, uh, then everybody kind of goes into wherever the, the reception's going to be. And that's usually where the band's set up and you have dinner and all that stuff. Uh, if you've been to a wedding, you know what I'm talking about. So cocktail hours happening as it's supposed to. And th during cocktail hour, at some point, you know, the bride and the groom make their appearance and that's all great and all that stuff. And then we move into the, um, the, you know, the, this all happens sort of outside. Uh, and so there was a tent under which the main reception was going to happen. And as we're walking into the tent, the band's playing. And I had heard them playing for a minute before we went in. And I thought, oh, man, because a lot of them had just arrived. You know, whoever had to do cocktail music, whoever had to do setup was already there. But then other band members started arriving. And it was like, oh, wow, they're doing their sound check late. Like, uh-oh, what's going on? Mm -hmm. And they kept playing as we moved into the room. It's like, ah, this is starting to feel less and less like a sound check. This is more and more like this is supposed to happen. And then somebody from the stage says, and they were, they were just playing instrumentals, uh, you know, funky kind of stuff. It was a band called the atomic funk project out of, uh, Manhattan. We'll put a link to them. Interesting, you know, website and stuff. Good, good. Uh, if you're in that business, uh, it's a good website to model after. And, uh, and they, said, you know, we'd like to, you know, introduce, you know, and they, they gave the bride and groom names and stuff. And, and then suddenly it was time for the first dance. I was like, well, this is really interesting. Oh, I guess while they were doing instrumental music, we were all sort of seated at our table, sort of. 
and they came over and took our dinner orders, which was interesting. But in fact, I was wondering if it was going to be a buffet because we, as part of the RSVP, we were not asked what our, you know, if we wanted the beef, the chicken or the fish. Right. And uh, so they took our dinner orders. And then once they had done that, uh, you know, during whatever instrumental music that was not quiet and they were, they were rocking out. And then they, they introduced a couple, they did their first dance halfway through the first dance as usual. Uh, the, you know, singer says, and we'd like to invite everybody to the dance floor to join the happy couple or whatever. And then they proceeded to play it like an hour long dance set. So this was really interesting to me. It was like, Whoa, the band isn't this thing that happens after everything is said and done. The band happened throughout the night and it really made for a nice flow because the dinner is always late. Like, Every wedding I've done this year, right. it's been 45 right, minutes right, right. late, right? It's just how it goes. You know, it's, there's a lot of people to coordinate for and all that stuff. But I have no, frankly, have no idea whether dinner was late at this wedding or not, because the band played until the caterer was ready to deliver dinner to the tables. And and it was like a full on, and they had given people enough appetizers and such during cocktail hour uh, that, you know, no one was like ravenous or or, or anything like that. So... It was, and then once dinner, I guess they served salad and they even served salad while the band was playing. And then once the entrees were ready, it was, okay, we're going to take a break now while you eat. And of course the band went inside, they ate too. Uh, but dinner, you know, was this thing that happened in the middle of the evening and a, a set of dance music had already happened. And, mm. uh, and, and I think... I, I can't quite remember exactly the the order of things. I I took some notes, of course, because you know it's me. But um, uh, the the speech is you know the the father of the bride speech, and then and then the you know uh, maid of honor and best man gave their speeches, and those were spaced out. The the maid of honor and best man gave their speeches back to back later in the evening after dinner. The the father of the bride he gave his speech that happened before dinner. Um, you know, at, while everybody was uh, like at the end of this dance set or something. So it was really, it was, a, it, and I have to say, like, it was really well paced. Um, so and, that, it, it sounds like it wouldn't be well paced. So, you know, that for most weddings, there is like this flow. Mm. Also, the people who have been to weddings, there's kind of expectation. And then the dance floor starts and everything happens. Yeah. You know, sometimes the band will play a, you know, a, a first dance song. Like we did a wedding earlier this year where, you know, the first dance song happens very early. We played the one song. Right. And then you go away for a long time. And then you and go away that, for a long time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And then, but, you know, but um, so when you said when you thought it was sound check, but clearly it wasn't, that was the equivalent of the cocktail set? No, the cocktail set had happened in, in the separate area where cocktail hour was held. And it was just for this particular setup, it was just the keyboard player playing tunes. And, and he was great. You know, I mean, he, he was having fun and and but, you know, very much background music. Right. When we walked in to the, you know, to the reception hall, if you will. I mean, it was under a tent, but it was the reception hall uh, The the band was playing like dance music. I think they started playing with uh, uh, Bill, a Bill Withers tune or whatever. But uh, but then it picked up. I mean, even that, you know, Bill Withers, I mean, anything from Bill Withers is grooving, you know. And, <laughs> uh, and so but, the, you know, light sort of light stuff. And then and then they were into it and people were up and moving and the dance floor was full before dinner. Oh, that's cool. For an hour. Yeah. No, it really it worked. And and I wound up talking to the event planner as we were leaving at the end of the night. And I just told her, I'm like this, you know, this was great. You did a great job. And she said, oh, thanks. You know, and I said. I play a lot of weddings. This was a weird flow. She said, you know, it depends on the couple. She said, but we've been doing this more and more. And if people really want to have a party, she's like, this flow works way better because that way you don't have the band playing two sets at the end so, of the night. And so, so your interpretation is that the flow was suggested by the event planner, not, yes. not, re not requested by the couple. Uh, it, it definitely was. Yeah. I mean, I, oh, I, know, I know the couple very well and, and they, they did not think of this. Yeah, no, it was the event planner <laughs> that said, that said, no, we should. I mean, and that's what an event planner's job is, is to listen to what you want and make suggestions and then make your vision happen, you know, but. Um, so yeah. let me do a little reality check with you yeah. here. So you know, we've been doing some weddings you know, over the years, increasingly, I'm finding that wedding, wedding events can be six hours of time long. Are oh, you, yeah. are you like, 
Yeah. Oh, like, for, oh, um, yeah. Sometimes longer. I'm I'm often there for closer to eight hours when all is said and done in terms of right. setup and and right. tear down and all tear that. Yeah, yeah, maybe even nine. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, but you know, an hour ceremony, an hour cocktail. Right. An well, the hour best dinner. is when the ceremony is not happening at the place where you need to set up. Sure. Right. Sure. Because then then that can sort of happen in parallel. But but yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And then, you know, a three hour party. Yeah. 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 It really, it, like, I loved this setup. And there's more about it that I love too that I'll, that I'll tell you. But then just the flow of the evening, it was like, dude, like, that's cool. Most of the weddings that we play, we have no involvement in the, you know, we just, they, they say, here's what we want. And we say, here's the price. And, you know, that's that. And so walk me through again, to go through the whole flow hour by hour is mm -hmm. what was going on. Yeah. So we walked in there. It's probably about 7 30. The band's playing. The band played until you've already been to the ceremony. Ceremony already. Ha oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Okay. So yeah, I was I was thinking about the band, but yes, yeah, ceremony happened at the church, which was like twenty minutes away because it was the you know special church for for the family and stuff. So great. Okay, ceremony happens. Then we all make our way to the to the reception. 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 Oh, I, I was off by an hour. Reception. Uh, cocktail hour started at five thirty, so it was about six thirty realistically quarter to seven cause it was raining and they had to set up like, like interim tents to get people from the one tent to the other tent. It wasn't supposed to rain. And then, you know, it's, it's, it's the Northeast. So this is how it goes. <laughs> uh, and it, so it did start raining. So they set up some extra tents that took an extra 15 minutes or something. Uh, even, even though we were only walking, you know, 15 feet or something, they were like, well, these, these people are all dressed up. We can't have them walking in the pouring rain. So, uh, what, what, what was the venue? Was the venue like a country club or was it, was, it just a wedding venue? Or? Yeah, it was a country club on what's called Lake Montauk, which is not really a lake. It's a saltwater inlet uh, sort of out at the tip of, of Montauk. But yeah, it was a country club. And sure. they didn't have nearly enough room inside for, you know, a wedding of 150 people. So they had to do this whole tent scenario outside, which was fine. It worked out great. Like, you know, I'm sure it cost them a fortune to do it, but, you know, whatever. Uh, people spend way too much money on weddings as, <laughs> as, as, uh, as anyone who plays in a wedding band can can attest, you know. Sure. Uh, yep. And so, you know, yeah, sometime by seven o'clock, we're in the the, uh, you know, in the hall, the band's already playing, right? They were playing before we walked in. We walk in and, you know, uh, what I said happened by about maybe, you know, 8.15 was when dinner was served. So the band played a, a, like a full hour and it, it was, it was happening. It was great. You know, uh, people enjoyed it. Then we ate dinner. There was, there were more speeches and, you know, the things that are supposed to happen, and, but it, 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 that didn't prattle on very long. It was okay. And now it's, you know, time for the band to rock out again. And that started at maybe nine and, uh, and, and then they played until 10, 15 or so. And, and the crowd actually requested an encore, which the band did, which surprised the heck out of the, the event planner. She, you know, cause they had like, they had started taking their ears off and stuff. So it was yeah. obvious they thought they were done and, and the crowd was calling for more and they did, they came and played one more tune, which um, the event planner was like, Oh my God, are they going to charge me for this? Like, you know, <laughs> this is gonna... then they didn't, they were, you know, they were good about it. So, uh, so yeah, it ended at like 10 30 and, and then there's a little beach area. They, they were they a bonfire. fairly standard wedding band, wedding band set type music? Yep. Pretty much. It was, you know, all the stuff you would expect to hear plus the, so, you know, it was all the stuff you would expect to hear. And, um, and, and then the, you know, the three songs that, that they have to learn, right. For the, for the, for the wedding, there's the couple's first dance and the, uh, what is it? The daddy daughter dance and the mother son dance. Right. And it, you know, where our table was, uh, and I, I'm sure this was intentional. You know, we were, uh, seated at a table that was sort of right next to the the stage. So I really got to sort of watch everything from the side uh, when I was sitting, which was great. And because I like, you know, to analyze this stuff. And man, that, so I learned two things. Number one, uh, it's not just our wedding band. It's every wedding band that puts in, clearly puts in the least effort possible uh, required to learn whatever the three mm -hmm. songs are that you're never going to play again. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was obvious that one of these three was one that they had played before. We've played it too. I can't remember the name of it. It's some country song about, you know, mother giving away her son. And, and it's, you know, it's a total tearjerker. It's all country songs. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, uh, 
you know, but this band was like a, I mean, a dance party band. So country stuff generally doesn't fit into that. It's more the funk soul, you know, that, that dance music. So they did their country songs and or whatever songs they were supposed to do. But man, I mean, watching them from the side, their energy level was, you know, 20 percent of what it was the rest of the night like this mm. this is a pro band and so i realized that i'm like oh i don't feel so bad you know for just like barely learning these songs because clearly that's what they're doing and they're just reading the, the lyrics off of their you know ipads or phones or whatever they had you know mounted on their mic stands but i looked and no one other than me was watching the band because that moment is not about the band in any way, shape or form. You are just, you know, providing the soundtrack to this other thing that's that's actually the important event. So as long as you don't totally ruin the song, you don't you don't actually have to perform it. Right. You just have to play it, which sure. is which was like an interesting lesson for me, because I'm always worried about, wow, you know, our energy level is 20 percent of what it normally is when we're doing these things. It's like, actually, you know what? No one cares. Totally works out fine. So all eyes are on the couple for all, that moment. All eyes are. Just yeah. Don't screw it up. Just don't. Yeah. Don't like play the wrong groove, for example, you know, or or sing the wrong lyrics like that stuff. There, there are things that matter, but you don't have to play the song like you wrote it. You know, you don't have to perform it like you wrote it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so what was, what was your first dance song at your wedding? <laughs> Dude, we didn't have a band at our wedding. We had um, we got married. Well, it depends on how you uh, how you define all this. So Lisa and I, there are many different ways to to host a wedding, and um, traditional weddings are not something that Lisa, my wife, or I really prioritized. Uh, we always joked about either getting married in uh, at Graceland uh, because that's a kitschy thing to do, or getting married in Las Vegas because that's another kitschy thing to do. When we got engaged, we already had a trip to Las Vegas. We got engaged in August. Uh, we already had it. We had, and we had been dating for like seven years. We had just bought a house together. And Lisa said, y you know, you're not getting some two year long engagement, buddy. You know, th we, we, this has gone on long enough. And, uh, and we already had a trip to Vegas planned for Halloween of that year to, of course, see fish play uh, their Halloween shows in 98. So, uh, she said, we're going already going to Vegas. We'll get, we're getting married in Vegas. We, you know, uh, booked our, our trip to start a little bit earlier. We told our families to come out and, and they did. And we got married at the Graceland wedding chapel at, in Las Vegas. So Elvis played, you know, an Elvis impersonator, of course, played love me tender while Lisa's dad walked her down the aisle. And then as soon as the wedding was over, Elvis put on this show and, uh, played, lots of Elvis's hits. Now we were convinced that of all the hits that he was going to play, suspicious minds would not be one of them. Cause that's not really the message that fits with a, that's a, funny. And that was the first song he played. That's so, really funny. So there you go. Suspicious minds. If, if there has to be a song that we call our first dance, suspicious minds would be it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How about you? What was your first dance? Whitney Houston. Nobody loves me like you do. Oh, uh, Nice. My yeah. daughter got married last year and, and she had uh, uh, the air that I breathe by the Hollies. That was pretty cool. Oh, see, that's pretty good. Yeah. And the House Rockers played it, which was kind of cool. Right. We right. Had a DJ What's that? You had a DJ yours. OK. Yeah. 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 yeah it's um, it's uh, it's yeah, like I said last week, I guess, or maybe two weeks ago. You can always tell a lot about the type of people that you're going to be playing for by interpreting those, th you know, those three songs, the the couples dance. And then the, the other two, it's like, Oh yeah. What, what kind of, you know, what kind of people are these? So, so you just played a wedding a couple of weeks ago for a good friend in Nick's and um, they did um, it's a Ben Harper song called in the colors. Mm -hmm. Great tune. That's cool. Well, it, yeah. and it was fun. That's fun. Yeah. That is the fun part about those songs is you are, you know, uh, forced for lack of a better term to learn a song that you may not otherwise pick for any band you're in, you know, sure. let alone a wedding band. So it is kind of cool. You get to dissect some of these tunes. It's like, Oh, and actually right. I'm, I would be a little bit opposite of it. I actually really love the idea that some couple chose my band mm -hmm. to be the part of this special day. So, you know, I don't think we, I don't think we've ever, I don't want to say phoned in, but I mean, I don't think we've taken that approach to, 
just get through it. I mean, we spend a fair amount of time on the requests and the, That's good. And the special things to try and get them done. But it I, seems I, like you might be in a in the minority on this. I, I, that might be, but yeah. but and I not that I mean, there's anything wrong with this. That. Yeah, I, I'm reflecting on the times when we're playing that and seeing a couple's first dance and seeing how, you know, their friends and family, and this is, you know, this is the most magical moment of their life. And it, it actually always resonates with me. I don't like the long days of playing weddings. I, right. you know, I don't, they're hard gigs. I don't like people telling us to turn down or to play something we don't know how to play or, you know, or, you know, the people are, Yep. you never get more rude. I've never had people talk to us at a club the way people have talked to us at weddings. Right. I, I mean, you, you are, you are most definitely hired to perform a function and, and some people there do not understand lose sight of the fact that you're it's actually a bunch of human beings look at that yeah. you know yeah yeah, yeah. It, it, that that's definitely true yeah, yeah. but the, i i actually really like that point of the wedding when you're when it's something meaningful you know that you're you're giving someone something that's going to hopefully last them a lifetime that that's kind of good remarkable stuff to me but like i said the, just in, in general getting weddings i mean they're okay paydays in general sure I mean, you don't take them if they're not if they're not at least okay but Long days, often, you know, long drives home. Yes. You know, they're, they're just a thing. It's just the last a thing. one we did was a great one, though. It was it was friends. Uh, uh, they're great people. They treated the band, you know, like we were the party and, you know, they wanted us to be in the mood to be the party. And yeah. so everything about it was great. The, the venue staff was actually great. They were surprised to see a band our size come into their venue and, you know, it was just a really, really fun party to be a part of. So when you get a good wedding, it's a pretty cool thing. It's a very cool thing. As I said to my son, you know, who this was really the first wedding that he's been to. I think he was at one when he was much younger. But, you know, this is the first one where he was, you know, a sentient being and and really able to take it all. in. he's 16. And uh, I said to him, like, oh, yeah, man, like weddings are the best crowds because they're like they're ready to go. All you have to do is play the first note and the dance floor is full and everybody's happy. Yeah. And you know, there's, there's no effort to begin the exchange of energy back and forth. You've got to continue to deliver, but it's way easier at a wedding than it is at, at like a club gig or whatever, where you're mm -hmm. trying to, you know, pull people out of seats sometimes. So we actually just had okay. that happen. I'm yeah. going to interrupt you for a second. No, go ahead. We have this regular gig that we've been doing for many, many years and we have packed the place every single time for as long as I can remember this last weekend, for whatever reason, and we haven't even been in this you know part of town for quite a while, it was less than what it usually is. I mean, it grew and its peak was okay, but it was such a jarring thing because it's it's been like money in the bank for years for us. Right. We'll play there. We'll play half a dozen shows a year out of this club, and it's far enough outside here where we've developed this audience. I've talked about this place on the show you know several times. And it was just less. And, you know, I was ex I was expecting it to be what it always is, which is right from the downbeat on. So we started with Let's Go Crazy by Prince. And, you know, four or five couples got down there. <laughs> and I was just saying, you know, it was, it was like, I, you know, I was like ready for what I thought was going to happen. And, uh, you know, and that's kind of an interesting thing because then we're like, OK, it's, it's different tonight. Yeah. What's going to happen? So I'm, you know, thinking about should I alter the set list? I'm thinking about. um I'm thinking about, is my band going to start playing differently because the energy is a little bit differently? And I'm just kind of like, you know, taking it all in. And we kind of go through the set list. And, you know, it was one of those gigs where it was fine. You know, people are appreciative. You know, when I would talk to the audience, there was less response back. So that was, and I, like when I welcomed the, the audience when we first took the stage, that was my first indication that it was going to be a little bit different. It wasn't the usual, like kind of hyper, you know, yeah. feeling in the air. Yeah. And so, you know, but you're, you're, you're on stage. It's time to go. And, uh, and like I said, the first song, the second song was Perm by Bruno Mars. Again, we, we, which we kill on and, you know, a couple people out and, you know, more people kind of starting to bop their head in the audience, that type of thing. And, uh, I decided to just plow ahead. You know, we're going to do our thing. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to make any drastic changes. I'm not going to back off the throttle. We're just going to do our thing. And uh, more often than not, that is the right choice, by the way. I mean, there are times when you got to back off, but but m less than you might think, I, yeah. I, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I, you're, you know, you're there are times and places where you make those subjective decisions. But this one, you know, I made this set list 
was a stuff that I thought would be great for the crowd we expected also had some things in there that I knew that I could slip in because um, we're playing to a crowd that, that, you know, kind of eats up whatever we do so I can, you know, get some work in on some tunes yeah, that have to be in the right place at the right time. And those tunes came up and I was like, Hmm, you know, yeah. should we? <laughs> and we just plowed ahead. And, you know, at the end of the day, this, the second set was, you know, was really solid from an attendance standpoint. It's funny because um, this guy, like I said, we for years have just killed it at this place and I'm ready to talk to the guy about, and he's wanted to talk to me about bookings for 2019. And I was about to <laughs> you know, ask for a pretty good, pretty good increase. And, uh, but this wouldn't have been the night to do it. Right. So, right, you know, right. just kind of, yeah, we'll talk. <laughs> we, yeah. Let's talk. You know, we'll, yeah, let's, let's talk in a couple of weeks. Yeah. yeah. Let's let this fade into memory a little bit. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Oh. So, so this band, this atomic funk project, it, um, they, they, w it was really interesting how they organized themselves on stage. There were three singers and, um, uh, two horns, sax and trumpet drummer, keys, bass player, guitar player, guitar player, never played a solo all night, by the way. Um, other than the, uh, you know, the, the, the guitar trill and don't stop believing if you want to call that a solo. But um, but otherwise, he was just a rhythm guy and a great rhythm guy. Uh, they were all good players. Every one of them was on in-ears. Mm. The only thing on stage that made any sound was the drum set. There mm. were no amps anywhere on stage. Like, everything went through the, the house system. Uh, oh, man. And, uh, and the bass player um, had a microphone. And we realized, oh, that's not in the house. That's in everybody's ears. He was the MD. It was very clear he was the leader of the band, at least on stage, flowing from one song to the next, counting tunes in and stuff. But it all happened so seamlessly because he was able to talk to everyone. There was no shouting around like, what's the next song? Are we changing? Are we sticking with the list? You know, none of that. Because he would just go up to the mic, say what whatever it was he needed to say. Everybody heard it. They were all counted in. Everything was fine. Um and you you can obviously only do that if everybody's on it ears. Otherwise, you know, yeah. But it, you know, the stage was clean. The stage was uh, not cluttered, and sound in the house anyway was stellar. Uh, in terms of each instrument, they had some they had some sound problems. Um, getting the they they had a handheld mic for the um, you know for people to do speeches, and it was consistently not working right. Which is to me is like inexcusable. If you you need to have that working no matter what, and then even though no matter what you have to have that working, you also need to have a backup. And I th the problem was either batteries in the wireless mic, but it, it like that should have been solved after the first mm -hmm. speech, and it really wasn't. But um, you know you should have a wired mic ready to go if if all else fails because those speeches are an important part of the evening. But um, but otherwise the you know, most important part of the evening, it, arguably I so. Mean, Yep. I mean, that, that program and that moment to, you know, honor the couple are really, you know, so when you're doing AV, you know, if you're the band AV guy and they're like, can we borrow your stuff for, for the yeah. announcements, you need to understand what you're, what you're volunteering for. What you you're know? signing up for. That's true. Totally yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. This is very important. And, um, they did get it worked out by the time my uh, brother and the, the, the groom, gave his you know th sort of thank you speech at the end of the night and um he and i were talking about it earlier in the night and he's like yeah what the heck is going on with this he's like this is not okay i'm like he's like do you think this is okay and i said no no that's like the cardinal rule that those and a strange need to thing right. for a seasoned wedding band you yeah know, have that issue that's a that's a unusual it, do you, did you talk to the guys in the band i mean were they i spoke they, with them briefly yeah i mean, I mean I were they just left them alone but were they just day job guys? Were they full-time musicians? Were they, were they, you know, like again, in major markets, yep. what I find often like top dollar wedding bands are often, you know, in between gig touring pro type things. That's who, that's who at least most of these guys were. Yeah. Uh, as I researched them, it was like, oh, okay, they've played with everybody. They're, they're, most of them are full-time musicians and this is just part of their gig. Yeah. Yep. Yep. But, um, but you know, the sound in the house was good uh, other than that. Uh, which again is a pretty big asterisk, but uh, in terms of the band, you know, the sound was good. Um, the drummer's ride symbol is too loud compared to everything else, but that's just me being really picky. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I, you know, I reserve the right. Uh, but it was really interesting seeing how, how a stage worked with no, no, there were no monitor wedges. There was like nothing, but it really made like, you know, they had what nine of them on this stage plus a sound guy, you know, out in the house and plus a, a separate MC uh, for the evening. So there were, you know, 11 of them near as I could tell that were there for the band. And, uh, but the nine of them on stage were not crowded at all. And it wasn't a, I mean, it wasn't a small stage, but it wasn't huge, but they got to use every inch of the, of the depth of the stage. Cause there were no wedges to worry about. They could, you know, the singers could be right up front. The horns were and the drums were right at the back. Uh, and it was all fine. And it, you know, if you're on in-ears, I think it matters less if you have, your amp on stage or not. Right. I mean, they had subwoofers and stuff for the, obviously for the, for the house. And you'll feel those on stage too, just proximity wise. But I thought, I thought it was that, a pretty what good do you thing. Think the, what do you think the value of that, of doing it that way is? Well, watching them pack up and leave certainly had value mm -hmm. because when the band left the stage and most of these guys just like grabbed their stuff and pieced out, like that was, it, you could, they were done. And, uh, and then there was a set of drums on stage and a bunch of mic stands and mm. that was it. And, you know, two stacks of speakers, one left, one right. So tear down super easy. And when you're talking about gigs, this is a band from, from Manhattan that came out to the Hamptons to do this. So I'm sure there was obviously an extra charge for that, but this is a band out of Manhattan where space is always at a premium. So yeah. You know, I have I have no doubt that that, you know, factored into their decision, however many years ago it was, they made it to just go all sans amps. It just seems so foreign to me. Like, you know, not, not you. My well-documented struggle yeah. with in ears aside, not moving any air to well, you, per, to perform music. Yeah, well, stage. you're moving air out of the out of the speakers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, think about the, here's the thing. It, it is foreign for those of us that are used to playing, you know, club stages, but for bands that are playing arenas, man, that's exactly what happens. You yeah. know, even if you have an amp on stage, like that's not doing anything other than getting your tone, which you're still hearing in your ears anyway. Right. You know, arena bands are doing exactly that. Bass players for the most part going direct. It's just mm -hmm. a set of live drums on stage and everything else is, is that's it. It's in, you know, mm -hmm. it's in the system. Why do you need it anywhere else? If you've got the right system, uh, you know, and again, like, like I said, the guitar player wasn't playing the leads, the keyboard player and or the horns would take the, the few leads that happened. I mean, there weren't many, right. Cause it's, it's just dance music all night, but um, so I don't know, you know, and I didn't get to talk to the guitar player. Um, he, he sort of ducked out pretty quick. But, you know, uh, if he was playing leads, you know, would he have felt different? I don't know that he would have. I mean, he, they were they were all on ears all night long. They never took him out because if they did, they'd stop hearing everything. <laughs> it's over. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Crazy, man. It, it was really interesting because it was, you know, like, I mean, obviously I was watching a, a band playing the role of a rock band on stage, but it very much had a lot of elements of theater gigs that I did, including you know, someone on stage with an MD, a music, music director's mic, uh, you know, just communicating with the musicians, p potentially communicating with the sound guy, I assume as well, but I don't know, uh, you know, but, but like all of that was happening too. And it's like, oh yeah, this is, this is a, a production that's happening here. Not, not just a band on stage playing at a wedding, which was interesting, you know? Yeah. That was fun. They did a good job. Cool. Yeah. 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 So I got some interesting, I'm going to do a little therapy session with you okay. here because I have a gig that's going in the wrong direction. Uh-oh. Yeah. That's not good. It's a gig I've been playing for quite a while. It's in my town. I've had many great shows there, solo acoustic shows. Um, I've been through, I think over five years, three or four booking guys. Um, the restaurant, so it's a restaurant at a winery. It's a, it's a wine bar at a winery, outdoor patio type of thing. Big you know, sizable. Um, uh, they did the booking themselves for a while. And then they had a couple incarnations of outsourcing the bookings. So I've been at a fixed fee there and it's a good fee. So I consider it a good gig, you know, good place, nice yep. people, you know, pays well, it clicks all the boxes for a good gig. 
I was first year I did it, I did four, six, and then it worked out well. And I, for about three years, I've been doing one, one a month. Oh, wow. Starting last year, it went down to about seven, right? Okay. And, and, uh, it's, there's a, there's a booking guy who's been in place for, I think two years now. And, uh, it's, it's gone down to seven and, um, recently they, they asked me if I would do a small quartet, you know, or put a combo together. They want more upscale music and, um, uh, the money, you know, uh, if I was getting X, it's not four X for a combo. It's not even, it's not even three X. It's not even two X. Right. And so, so this, to me, you know, the number of gigs per year, the frequency has gone down. Now the pay is starting to go down. Um, I like the gig and I like the place, but when a gig starts going in the wrong direction, you know, it, there's a couple of things in my mind. One is I know the people who actually are at the venue. I, I don't, the guy who is the booking guy is a nice enough guy and he's been really cool to me. You know, I think he's got his guys and that's, who's been getting more of the bookings. That's, you know, one of the reasons that it's been going down the interest I don't know the guy well enough. You know, it's an email and occasional, really occasional phone conversation. You know, I don't know. I just did a, a solo gig and the new manager at the, at the venue thought it was great. And so I said, you know, y- you asked me to do this combo. She goes, I don't know anything about that. Uh, and so there's a little question mark as to what the actual communication, whether she had the conversation with the person before her had the conversation with the booking guy. Anyway, the gig is going in the wrong direction. And so the doors I have in front of me to walk through are to press my own agenda directly with the venue and get them to say, no, we want Paul to do this. Yep. Um, which would likely tick off the booking guy. Um, uh, I could walk away from the gig and, wait to be asked why I did again, it's in my town. So that, you know, there'd be, you know, some, I'm not going to say, you know, <laughs> they're not going to go out of business if I don't play there, but I mean, there'll be some questions, Sure. but you know, the, the issue is once things start going in that direction, saving things is hard, not impossible, but hard. Um, and sometimes you say, well, listen, this is going in the wrong direction. Let's call a spade a spade and, you know, let's move on, you know, good run here. Time to move on. Yeah. My inclination is to try and have a chat with the venue themselves at the risk of, um, at the risk of, uh, disenfranchising the booking guy. Um, did did you you take the same tact? So a couple of questions, um, with regards to this booking person, do you work with them elsewhere? Or is this the only place? No. Okay. All right. Well, so, cause that, you know, obviously factors in like, what's, what's this relationship with this person w- worth? And, and then the question to ask is, are you, is your current, is your rate, which it sounds like has been your rate all the way through. Is that now much higher than what other solo acts are getting there? Like, is this or another way to ask it, is this new rate that they are proposing to you in line with what they're paying everyone else? And they're asking if you want to, perhaps not in the most tactful ah, way, but so, asking, are do you would you like to continue playing here? If so, here's how the new way works. And we need you to join us. Right. Again, they're not clearly not being that tactful about it. It may not even be that question they're asking, but it's possible it is. Yeah. So that's, that's really well thought out, Dave. So, so yes, there's a new pay structure yeah. that soloists get less than what I'm getting now and quartets get what they're off, you know, quintets get what they're offering. Sure. Um, but to some degree that pay structure for solo is part of the things are going in the wrong direction. Right. Yes. I mean, yes. Uh, don't, no, I d- don't disagree at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Again, you, even if it wasn't about this, you know, can you put together a combo? Cause that's the style of music that we want, which I still got to figure out, you know, where the reality of that is, you know, if you work for a place that asks you to take less money and provide you less work, that's the definition of going in the wrong direction. Right. Yep. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Now so, there are times though, when, the you know the local economy for lack of a better descriptor changes and the thing that used to be worth x is now worth half of x or or you know some other fraction thereof right 
So this is a place that got voted best place to see live music. You know, huh. it, it's a it's a winery that sells fifty dollars bottles of wine. I mean, it's it's um, it's um, it's a good venue. And you know what I don't know is how they're coming to their decisions, right? Yeah. I don't know. You know, like you said, is it an economy thing? Is it a we could pay less and we won't won't have any less number of people wanting to play, pay here, which right. is possible. I don't know how much guidance they're getting from the outside booking guy. I don't know how much of the decision making is, is happening from internally. But all I know is like the indications are this is heading in the wrong direction. Is the booking person a new addition to the process or has this person been uh, Two years. involved for a while? Okay. All right. Yeah. Because a lot of times, you know, the a, a venue will do things on their own for a while and then contract with a booking person. And this booking person needs to come in and show their value. Right. And one way to show their value is by, you know, taking the headache away of booking all the acts. But then the additional way to show value is to literally show value and say, Hey, you know, you paid X for a hundred performers last year. Now you're only paying three quarters of X for a hundred performers, you know, and that also includes my fee. Aren't I worth it to you? You should, you know, you should continue to employ me. Like those kinds of things definitely well, happen. Continue yeah. to employ me. Okay. Share that difference with me. <laughs> it would, be the, <laughs> would be the sinister thing, right? Yes, of course. Yeah. So, and I, I don't know that I'll ever get that type of information. So the question is, right. at what point in time do you just say, Hey, I got to look out for me. I have two, two doors here. I can take a swing and try and fix the situation that's going downhill. The casualty for this might be a booking relationship. Yep. Uh, right. Or, you know, I can just kind of take it and, you know, say thank you, or I can walk away, right? And um, my instinct is telling me, go through the first door. The question is, is there, a, you know, I guess I can give the booking guy a heads up and just say, hey, this is going the wrong way. I know the, the people there. You know, I live in this town. I'm, I, you know, I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to have a, I'm going to have a conversation with them. Well, why not He'll, take it a, a one step further and invite the book, booking person to be part of that conversation, right? Cause that way you're not cutting them out. You are telling them, I want to have, we, we all need to talk. Interesting. Right. Let, Interesting. Let's all talk. It's fine. I mean, what it, it's not, I'm going to guess he would find that if, if there's any part of this that is unknown to me that he, you know, if he, he may find that confrontational, right? Abs he might, it, especially if it's his agenda right. that that is being served here. If he is serving the uh, the club's agenda and simply doing his duty to, you know, to make them happy by their own definition, then this shouldn't be a problem at all. Because, you know, this whole I, and I I totally get that if you do an end around and go directly to the club, either to book directly or you know, even just to have this conversation, this booking agent could very easily take that as an attack, but it really isn't right. You don't have the contract with the booking agent. The club has the contract with the yeah. booking agent. So if the club, for whatever reason, chooses to book directly with an artist and the booking agent has a problem with it, that's a booking agent having a problem with the club not the booking agent having a problem with a band because the if you could go to the club and say, Hey, I'd much rather book directly with you. We had a good thing going now that this other guy's here. It's not as good. They could say, yep, sorry. You got to talk to that guy. Right. Very well, the easily. Deal is, and nope. Like, okay. That's it. Yeah. And I guess that's it. It's like, you know, we can kind of dance around the issue, but at the end yeah. of the day, you find out exactly where the leverage is. Right. That's so, it. so yeah. if I'm worth it to them and they want me there, you know, because I live in the community, because I promote their venue, because I bring a good crowd when I play. If it's worth it to them, let's have a business conversation. If that's it's right. not worth it to them, if they say, hey, that's why we employ this booking guy. It's his decisions and we support him. Then that's the answer as then well. That's the answer as well. Yeah. Right. And there's so, and, and there shouldn't be. And I mean, I say this, you know, tongue almost in cheek, but but there really shouldn't be a problem with any. So you get these three parties involved in this scenario. Right. Yeah. There shouldn't be a problem if two of the parties talk, uh, the third party, the excluded party should not feel any problem there because everybody's allowed to talk to each other. Like it, it, we deal with the same thing sometimes with ad agencies in our, in our sales business, right? Where I, you know, we'll have a relationship with the brand. We'll have a relationship with the agency. The brand chooses to, to contract the agency to place all their, their advertising buys. Fine. 
But that doesn't mean I can't still talk to the brand. The brand makes the I, I, I'm not trying to get the brand to do an end around. If they want to do that, that's not, that's their decision. It's not up to me. It's their money. They do whatever they want. But most of the time, the reason I would want to have a conversation with the brand is to just maintain that relationship for a variety of reasons, including if they ever decide to fire their agency, I want to be on the list for the next agency. <laughs> you know, yeah. like it like I am not doing work for the agency. You are not doing work for the booking agent. You are doing work for the venue. And so is the booking agent. So either one of you talking to the venue is fine up until the point where the venue tells you, hey, man, we've hired this guy. So we don't have to do this anymore. We don't have the time. We've 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 delegated this. I need you to talk to that guy about this. Once the once the, the venue does that. OK, well, now it's clear. Great. You got your answer. But if the booking agent finds out about that conversation, that should that there shouldn't be any uh, feathers ruffled. I mean, most of the time there will be. And I, I'm fully aware of that. But it's ridiculous to me. It's just like, dude, we're just having a conversation. It's all yep. good. It's all good. It's all good. Yep. And yeah. the guy's a musician. The booking guy is a musician. So he should have some concept where this is coming from. But you should give him a heads up. I, I think give him a heads up or invite him to be part of that conversation. Uh, potentially help smooth over those ruffled feathers before they get ruffled, but it might not work. I mean, you, you know, you, you, you know, you, you're, you're going into this, there's a risk that you're going to burn that particular bridge or this guy's, but it's going in the wrong direction, right? It's so, already yeah. going in the wrong direction. And maybe, and that's maybe the way to start. Hey, look, this is going in the wrong direction for me. I want to have this conversation. Would you like to be there? Or should I just do this with them, but make it clear. Don't give him the option to, to handle it unless Unless you want to, but it sounds like that's probably not the right thing. You want to, yeah. you want to hear it. You need to hear this from the venue is what I'm hearing from you. So. Yep. Yeah. That's it. Good. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy though. Bill. This is how, this is how the, uh, this is how the business works. And it, it, it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, you know, everybody has their little fiefdoms is what it is. And, mm -hmm. um, and we all get, uh, protective of our, of our little fiefdoms. And it's, it's human nature, right? We are flawed creatures at the core. Truth. <laughs> but that's why we like art so much. And that's why we like music. And that's why we like doing this. So it's good. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Uh, you got anything else for us today? No, good stuff. Wedding good. stuff, negotiating stuff. Yeah. Just another, just another week on gig gab. It's just another week on gig gab. All right, folks. Well, that's how we're going to do it here. If you have anything to add, anything to say, any thoughts, any questions, make sure to, uh, to send them to us at uh, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We would love to hear from you. In fact, we got some, uh, some mail we got to go through next week. Paul, so. Send it in. Feedback at gigapodcast.com. What is it? What is it that we say, Paul? I always forget. Always, even when you're performing a first dance song that you really are not that into. But really, come on, dudes. They're getting married. Always be performing. <laughs>